Hello, I'm Christopher, and welcome to the Cabin Boy Knits at Woolcast. And I'm Jamie. This is our next installment in our Canadian interview series. I'm super excited about this one. We are interviewing Kirk Dunn, and he is a gem that everyone needs to know about. He is an accomplished playwright and actor. You may have seen him in a number of film and television productions. He also has a one-man show, The Knitting Pilgrim. And his glass stitch is unbelievable. He has tapestries that are nine feet tall and five and a half feet wide. They're absolutely beautiful. He's been profiled in Vogue magazine, Maclean's magazine, and the CBC. And he even interned with Calf Facet. So sit back, grab your favorite drink, and he'll tell you his story. Super excited to be here with Kirk Dunn. And for those of you who don't know Kirk Dunn, Kirk, who is Kirk Dunn? Oh, my. Well, uh, Kirk Dunn is um, a guy who does a number of uh, things. Uh, I guess a, um, a jack of all trades, master of, of none could be. Um, I am a, an actor, a writer. I am a customer service consultant, and I'm a knitter. And uh, I, uh, I, I, and I suppose I'm quite a bit uh, further into the fiber art space than I than, than I used to be at um, and it took me a while to uh, get there or not so much a while to get there but I spent I spent about 15 years working on one major project uh, to put me there and that was my project of uh, stitched glass. Why don't we jump which, into that right now? Okay sure. Okay. <laughs> and then we'll go back in time but I really want to now that you brought it up. Um, okay. So tell us a little bit about that project. How did it start? What was the what was the motivation? What was the inspiration? Hmm. It. Yeah, it's, well, well, it, I had, I had at that by that point, I had, um, I guess it's about, I'd fallen in love with knitting, and I had uh, knit all kinds of um, sweaters, and I actually had studied with Kay Facet for a month at his studio in uh, in London, England, and I just loved working with color, and um, I, I used to think of sweaters as being wearable art, and and I would. I, love designing them and making them and at one point my my wife um she went to a, a film center party because my my wife is a uh, uh a writer for film and tv uh clara and uh and she met the head of the textile museum of, of canada oh, yeah. named natalie nage and uh and they struck it off and um uh claire told natalie about my knitting and natalie said oh well have him bring by his stuff to the textile museum and i'll uh, i'll take a look and of course, I didn't want to do that, but I said, you have to go. <laughs> so I brought all my all my knitting, and um, Natalie looked at this, and she said, you know, really, I mean, this is great, but there's sweaters, and, you know, the textile museum and galleries don't really care about sweaters. You, you, want, to, you want to do something like an installation. You want to, you want to do something like, like a, a piece of art. Yeah. And I thought, I have no idea what that is going to be. Uh, and then... Um, uh, months later, as I was, uh, as I was actually up sitting in church, was trying to keep my kids quiet, we were very young at the time, and I looked at some stained glass windows, and I thought, now those are beautiful. I would, and the because col the colors are fabulous, you know, light yeah. shining in them, they're really rich blues and reds and greens, fabulous. And I thought, I would like to knit some of those. And then this project occurred to me about, because this is just slightly after 9-11, when that was you know, very much in the news. And I, I was looking at the, at just the, the irony of the, the, the three Abrahamic faiths. So Judaism, Christianity, Islam, and how they were all basically saying the same thing. They all came from the same root. And yet, you know, here they are, here we are all blowing each other up and killing each other and having wars over these things where we really should be you know, pretty much on the same path. And so I came up with this idea to, to look at these three faiths by knitting three full-sized stained glass windows. So they're huge. They, and they turned out to be about five feet wide by nine feet tall. And each one looks at the commonalities and the conflicts between of each faith. So Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. 
And I thought, oh, and I, I, so I, I applied for a um, arts council grant for this and I got it and it was like $45,000. So it was a Excellent. lot of money. Congratulations. Yes, well, thank you. Uh, but then when you, <laughs> when you amortize it over the time it took me to, <laughs> it didn't really work out very well. Um, but uh, yeah, and I thought it would take me like 10 months. I thought you know, when, I, when, I, when I did the um, Arts Council application, I said, oh, yeah, it's going to take 10 months. I'll, I'll be fine. Uh, and of course, it took me 15 years mm -hmm. to, to knit these things. So, uh, and that's, and, and then what happened was uh, because I spent 15 years on this one project and because I studied as an actor and I, you know, was making money doing other things and acting and corporate server and corporate training and all kinds of stuff. I didn't really have, um, I, I didn't have any uh, resume as an artist. And so um, galleries weren't interested in me um, and the museums weren't and the, and you know, I just didn't have any pedigree. As, a, as an artist. And so I couldn't get any traction to actually get this project shown. So I was obliged to go to the problem for the solution. And that was um, that I could actually, because I'm an actor and a writer, I could write a play about it and make that the way of showcasing the project. And so Claire and I wrote The Knitting Pilgrim, which is a, a one man uh, show about my journey. And I like to say that it's all about knitting and not about knitting at all. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's about my journey in knitting these three huge um, pieces of art and, uh, and what happened to me along the way and what happened to the people I met along the way. So that's fantastic. And, and you've been, you've toured, you've been on tour. Yes. Uh, we, and uh, we toured on tour. I think we did about 50 shows. And then of course, COVID came along and yeah, no one's doing any shows anymore. So, um, you know, doing, uh, doing what I can to uh, stay active there. And I'm actually working on, one of the things that happened was uh, after we, we do the show and, and these pieces would be revealed at the end of the show and people would come up and spend some time getting close to them and looking at the stitches and stand, standing back and look at the images. And, and I get a lot of questions about, you know, what do all these images mean? Because each one has got you know, lots and lots of um, um, representational images because I'm, I'm looking at the ideas uh, that, that are going on between the faiths. Um, and I, and I didn't have a document to give them and didn't have like, um, you know, a, a program or, a, or a, you know, like a show calendar or something like that. So uh, I'm now working on something called the Knitting Pilgrim Talks, which is, uh, uh, it's going to be a, um, a, a podcast kind of um, web series that where hopefully people, the idea is people are going to be able to go online and see the windows and click on a section and then that'll take them to an interview where I'm talking to an imam or a rabbi or a minister about that particular section and the ideas behind it. And so I'm having a lot of fun. <laughs> I'm learning a lot and having a great time talking to these people. So that's, uh, that's incredible. That's right. that's what's, incredible. So what's, so there's, there's a lot of, um, I mean, you, you're, this has been one long journey, but there's, there's mm -hmm. components beginning 15 years ago. I mean, yep. when you, you had the idea of the stained glass windows and then um, the connection with the Abraham, uh, how, how did you say it? Abrahamic. A Abrahamic faiths. Yeah. Faiths. So Judaism, yeah. Christianity, and Islam. So mm -hmm. you had to do somewhat some research yourself. Your background is... Oh, yeah. But my, my background is a Christian, so I'm Presbyterian. I, so, my, so you my, have yeah, to... my father's a Presbyterian minister. So yes, yeah. so you... I think, but third generation, right? It... Yes, or, uh, fourth generation. Fourth generation. Oh, right. Yes, because it, I know I'm the fourth generation. There are yes. three generations yes. before before me yes. who were Presbyterian ministers, and then I dropped the ball. <laughs> so you would have had to um, you you would have to maybe do a little research on Judaism oh, yeah. and Islam because now you're going to create these these tapestries based on these faiths. So oh, yeah. obviously, as you mentioned, there's a lot of symbolism. So I did read something that you, um, one of, a rabbi had recommended a, a book on Judaism, which was uh, at the entrance of the Garden of Eden, which says yeah. you had a profound positive impact on you. That's still to yeah, this yeah. your journey. So that's an example of some of the research you had to do as part of it. So I guess my question would be, you know, in your research, you would have to choose which symbols to sort of play a role in this tapestry. How do you choose amongst, is, 
I, I don't know anything about these other faiths. I grew up Catholic, let's mm-hmm. say, so be yeah. along the lines of the Christian faith, I, I, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. That's mm-hmm. all the same category. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. as, along with these others, like, yeah, how do you choose that? Oh, this is one of their primary symbols, or was it something more personal that touched you that you thought would be more important? And I know yeah. the common ground being the um, the, the what the what was in common within these three faiths, and then yeah. also the differences. So how did yeah. you go about choosing and why certain symbols? Maybe some examples, because I mean you've got dozens of symbols in each. But as a general, yeah, sure. how did you come about design? I mean, I I was hoping that I was going to you know be very uh, universal, and I would um, you know all this research and it'd be very learned and you know. Um, um, I'd be unassailable for my choices, right? But I was, you know, to be to be very um, yeah, you know, frank, it, they're all my choices, and you know, it's yes. it's my bias and it's my point of view. And um, I also uh, you know, was was terrified by that, just absolutely yes. paralyzed with terror about you know these choices I'm making for some faiths that I that aren't my faiths. You know, I mean, I'm, I can talk right. about Christianity all I want. I can do anything I want with that and feel very comfortable because, hey, I'm a I'm Christian. I grew up in the Presbyterian Church and I can say things. I mean, people, so, you know, I, I can't, um, I have, I may have views about Catholicism that, Catholic, that Catholics might have a problem with that sort of thing, but that's, yes. that's I, I'm used to that kind of thing. Whereas, you know, um, putting up an image about uh, Judaism, that would be, uh, you know, that would be the, really um well it's frightening uh, and actually at one point i did a um i took all my pieces i didn't have the the um didn't have the window assembled yet but i t- took all my pieces and i did a presentation at a, a century festival and i was showing slides of it and one of this pieces is a it's a piece um it's a, it's the dove of peace and it is um, the Hebrew letters for shalom, so the letters in Hebrew, and they are in the shape of a dove, right? And I've got that, and I, you know, show it up, up to the uh, audience of, you know, here it is. And I get a woman who came up to me after and said, um, "I think you got it backwards. Like you did it backwards." <laughs> And I did like my heart sunk because I'd already knit this piece, right? And yes, I, yes. I can't believe I knit it backwards. But and I, and I showed her the piece, and then I, I like I put the rummage in my bag, and I actually pulled out the actual piece. And said, oh no, it was just the it was just the slide was flipped around. That's all. Oh, so literally, but I just just about bounced. Like- I thought, oh, I can't believe I did that. Wow. Yeah. So it's so typical. Anyway, so I had lots of moments like that where. Where the things, uh, uh, you know, the images I was coming up with, I wonder, am am I going to annoy people with this? And uh, you know, and and people ask, well, "Aren't you a little bit concerned?" And I will say, "Yes, very concerned. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'm terrified the whole time." Um, well, but they generated uh, a lot yeah. of talk. I'm sure, like it's well, as one could imagine, because you know, here we are, you know, talking about starting off with the, the religious part of this knit project, um, but like you're saying i mean to choose these images and you're saying now it's just it was your your choices based on maybe um what you thought would look best i'm thinking okay is it you want the dove because you want you know that's not that colorful but yeah. maybe you chose something else for a color but color is secondary to the themes i'm sure right. so yeah. but your artistic side of it is going to say dictate the colors but yeah the symbolism like you say you're going to show these in public you know did you capture a true nature of, of what that uh, religion and the beliefs are but or is it that you know you, you came this far 15 years later and now where where you decided how am I going to present these and you and, and now you've, you've created the one-man show but along the way and in the beginning it wouldn't have necessarily because you had this journey and probably some revelations and some you know something to say but I may be getting that from the beginning you weren't necessarily making these where you knew there would be a story to tell later. The story seems like it evolved yeah. over the years. And, yeah. and then when you thought, how am I going to present these? There was a story because of your beliefs and maybe your biases or unbiases, or, or yeah. you're not trying to do the right thing. You were just creating art, really, right? I, I imagine, yeah. based on religion, which, like you say, pretty risky business. 
Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, I thought that when I finished it, I just like, okay, I'd frame it, I'd put it up, I, you know, someone would take it, then they'd put it in a gallery and maybe we'd get a tour to yeah. various places. And then none of that happened. You know, they just got it rolled up and stuck in a, in a number of cedar chests. Um, so the fact that, uh, you know, I'm, I'm now moving them around and I put them up and I take them off for each show and then I, I'm actually there with them and, um, and I, uh, and relating to the audiences as they interact with them, I mean, that it makes it much more uh, personal and uh, and immediate, and it just sort of keeps the whole thing uh, whole thing going on. So it's and, been great. And it's been in the Aga Khan. Is it? Were you there recently? Yeah, we started at the Aga Khan. Uh, the, yeah, the Aga Khan Muse Museum. Um, they have a beautiful performance space where they are, you most often do uh, musical performances. Mm -hmm. um, but the beautiful theater, great sound. And uh, and we did three shows there in May of 2019, I think it was. That's right. When, uh, those are our first shows. Yeah. Now we talked a little shows. bit about the inspiration. Um, I was. What about the artistic influence? Was there any artistic influences when you were creating these stained glass, or was it just coming from your heart, or did you have it? I was just curious about that because I did see um, in one of the, a blanket that you did, made earlier, and in one of yes. your stained glass pieces, there were. Two artists that I was thinking of, so I was just wondering if there was any influence. Oh, oh yeah. Uh, well, certainly, you know, um, the K Facet is the is certainly oh, the, that's, uh, yeah. the, the main through. influence. Yeah, yeah. Um, I remember I at, when I started knitting, I started um, well, I started a bit of a dare really because I was an actor, and um, I just got out of the theater school and I was touring around Northern Ontario in a in a kids show in a van and uh you know lots of driving and between this like a very short show a half hour show and then you know you drive to Kenora like whoo that's that's a long drive <laughs> that's it that, um, that is <laughs> uh and uh anyway um it, the, the show I was doing it was for, it was sponsored by the Ontario Women's Directorate and it was all about gender equity and the yeah. show was called Girls Can boys can. So the idea being what girls can do, boys can do, what boys can do, what girls can do. And um, so I was cast, I was, I was the, you know, the, the rough and tumble boy. And I was cast opposite a, um, a, a wonderful actor uh, in Gina Clayton. And she was the tomboy. And, you know, we would, you know, we were sparring the whole time in this as 12 year olds, like we were playing 12 year olds. Anyway, the idea was anything you can do, I can do. And we, we that was our relationship in the show. And it turned out to be a relationship on the tour too and um and we actually like it was up around kenora i think in wawa we walked into a trading post and they had all these beautiful sweaters and i, I was looking at the sweaters i thought wow these are gorgeous i think i'm gonna buy one and gina walks by and says yeah i could knit that and i said well <laughs> you could knit that i could knit that and that was where i you know i figured okay well i'm gonna i, I can knit i'm gonna, I'm gonna learn how to knit <laughs> and so that's where I came from. And she, she actually helped me um, learn, uh, learn to knit. And I got a little book too. That's a, a little Peyton's book, like how to knit. And yes. I followed the, followed the pictures. And, um, and what I wanted to knit was a sweater. So she gave me a pattern for an Icelandic sweater, which I liked because it had three colors, right? So yeah. I, cause I like colors. Uh, and then I knit that, that when that was knitting, uh, I knit my entire family Icelandic sweaters. And I, cause I also had a, a day job as a starving actor. My day job was uh, as a security guard doing the midnight shift on the weekends at a hospital. Because oh gosh. Wow. I knew that no one would ever ask me to act during that point. Yeah. So I could, I could keep that and be an actor, yeah. right? So that's yeah. what I did. So I had all this time on my hands. I burned through about 15 or 16 Icelandic sweaters. And I, I, I like them because of the color, but and then I walked into a, a bookstore and there was this K Facet book there. And yeah. I, oh, now that is color. Yes. That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> I want to do that. Yeah. And so, but of course, I'm a star, starving actor, you know, so I, like, I would go to a, I remember going to a knitting store and saying, I'd like to, you know, do have like one of those K facet kits? And they said, yeah, sure, here it is. And I saw the price tag and said, yeah, that's great. Thank you. I'll, um, I'll, I'll get back to you on that. Yeah. So I would go to the discount yarn and I, you know, find colors I liked and I do that. And I did lots of his patterns. And then I started designing my own, you know, uh, pieces. And that's kind of how I got into it. And, and from there, and, uh, you know, I, I also, once, once I, I, I fell in love with his, his patterns, but I also got to that point where, okay, uh, I'm an accomplished enough knitter now. I know I can do that. I mean, when I see the picture of it, I know I can knit it. Mm -hmm. And that wasn't quite, and so it, it became an exercise of, okay, do I, 
do I like that enough to spend all that time knitting that thing when I kind of know what's going to happen? I mean, it's so that like they, for, for a while I was, I wasn't sure I could do it. And so I was, you know, wondering, am I going to be able to pull this off? And then I got to the place where, oh, yeah, I can do this. And, and so I thought, you know, what would be more interesting is to try to design something of my own. Like that would be interesting. Like what's going to happen. Yeah. And that's where I started doing my own designs. And the thing I liked about, um, that too, that one of the things I got from some of the case patterns was the idea of using multiple colors at the same, in, uh, multiple strands of yarn at the same time of different colors. Right. And that's really what I did a lot with, um, with the stitch glass because it, it didn't have to be, it didn't have to be a garment. So um, I could use lots of yarn, right? It, was, it could be actually very heavy. No one had to be expected to wear it, yeah. right? So I could use like um, sometimes as many as five strands of yarn in one, in one stitch. I mean, they'd be you know, of a very fine gauge, but, and I liked playing with the, the colors there and it's, and it was, it became, it was, it was fun choosing the colors of my own. I like that ability to like, I had control over, okay, I wanted a green. What's the screen going to be? I'm going to try a dark green and a, and a Kelly green and I put a blue in there and a yellow in there and then like a mint and then we'll see what happens and how those they twist and they play as they, as they come out. Cause I don't have control over that part, how they, how right. they actually mix. And um, that was, uh, that was really interesting for me. That was where, where the joy was and um and it, it actually worked out really well for the um for stitch glass for, for the um the the panels because it looks like there's a play of light on them but they're totally opaque yes. of course but it actually looks like there's yeah. light shining as opposed to just one flat color it would look just one color would look very flat yeah. whereas this looks like something's actually wow it looks like there's light coming through them so and that's okay. difficult that's difficult to do yeah. Like uh, to create an image, I mean, you could imagine all the different uh, ways of creating an image uh, in the art world, uh, fiber to give it some dimension and, and, and layering and light reflecting off of it. It's not like you could use, uh, you know, like an artist would use paint, but which is what you're trying to recreate and let alone glass, which is so reflective. But I, you know, when I first saw the panels myself, I have to say like, this is why I'm very surprised when you mentioned getting them out there in there. Well, because they're that art, it, it, it's, it, it's absolute stunning. art and it's stunning. And if they knit you, and I'm a new knitter. So I mean, I'm knitting my first <laughs> sweater as, as we speak. I'm about to far along. And the intricacies, but I mean, I'm just using blocks, you know, a stripe. I mean, the intricate, you know, like you say, variations in color and tones to create something that looks like a stained glass. I mean, I don't understand how these, you know, art institutions, I don't care if you're, you know, don't have this pedigree or whatnot, <laughs> have a look, folks. Maybe you need a little explanation, but imagine each one of those stitches and the hours to do one panel, let alone the full, you know, the one full window. Yeah. Yeah, that I'm, I'm very surprised by, but I'm thinking that, you know, it's getting out there in your play. And I think it's only a matter of time that these are absolute works of art that need to be shown, but more so is you, you have something to say along the way, which makes it even that much more appealing. And the journey, maybe that's, you know, mentioned uh, journey. I, okay, but I want to step in for a second. Yes. But it's not like people haven't recognized, you've had great feedback yes. on, your, on your show um, at yep. Fringe Festivals, and yes. there's been a movie you've had a movie yeah, made a film yes yeah. a, a oh, documentary film yeah which is excellent so yeah. it's great i can i i just want to ask yeah. though, how does a boy a canadian kid end up at calf facets place as an intern <laughs> like I was, okay. when i read well, that i just thought oh my gosh i have yeah, to find that's, out <laughs> that, that's all that's all claire's fault as well it's, 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 it's claire she does it so i um I had, uh, you know, I I'd found, as I say, I found Cave's books and I had to knit a bunch of his sweaters and, and then I was starting yeah. to knit my own stuff too. And um, Cave came, Cave and Brandon, uh, Cave and Fassett and uh, Brandon Mabley came to Toronto again to, to a, uh, a stitchery festival. I can't remember which one it was. And um, uh, Claire said, well, why don't you go and meet him and show him your, your stuff, show him your, uh, the work you're, you're doing. And I was actually, I, I was knitting a, a piece for my father 
um, who, who like I said was a minister and he loves orange. Mm -hmm. And so I knit him this, um, it, it was actually from an altar cloth from one of the churches he, um, he, he was at. It was a bunch of crosses. It's a, a, a motif, a repeating motif of crosses. And they were, so they were, um, he loves orange. And so of course the complimentary color to orange is blue. So I knit him this orange and blue thing. And of course, because the way I like to use color, Anytime I wanted to use orange, then that could run the gamut between uh, red all the way, you know, red on one side to yellow on the next, right? Mm -hmm. So anything that was fair game for orange. And then for blue, um, anything from uh, green all the way through blue into purple, that was fair, fair game for, for blue. So th that's kind of the way it, um, I constructed it and just play with those colors. And I, I had you know, one person look at it and say, wow, for a... For an orange and blue sweater, there is remarkably little orange or blue in it. <laughs> it's very strange, but it looks orange and blue. It's just when you look right, get really yeah. close, it's oh, there's hardly any orange or any blue in there. It's everything else. So um, anyway, I, I showed this to Cave, and Cave was very impressed, and uh, he said, "Wow, that's that's pretty amazing. That's you, you know, this is this is exactly uh, this is the kind of stuff I love." And I said, oh, thank you. That's lovely. And I went away thinking, oh, well, that was nice. Very nice of Cave to say that. And Claire said, well, why don't you should get in touch with Cave and Ben and ask if they'd be interested in having you over to, you know, for a month? Because she had, she had some family in London, so I could stay with them. Sure. You know, you could just show up and do stuff around you, the apprentice, and be at the... Um, studio, you know, you, you wouldn't have to, they would have to pay you. You just sort of go for a month and hang out and do whatever needed to be done. And so I, I ran this by cave and he said, sure, that'd be great. <laughs> and, so, and so that's what we did. Um, I went over there for a month and it was actually, it was just, so Claire was pregnant with our, our first, yep. first child. Uh, and so I went in May and uh, Claire gave birth in in uh, August. So um, I basically, you know, she said, you can go now or not at all. Like, you know, yeah. make up your mind. You want yeah. to do it? Yeah. You do it now. Right. So that's, uh, that's what happened. And then, and I became great friends with uh, Kafe and, uh, and Brandon, and I helped out of the studio and we did all kinds of stuff. We, you know, and Kafe, um, you know, taught me a lot, not just about knitting, uh, but also just about how to be, how to be an artist. And, and he, he had a studio for uh, for mosaic. He he had a painting room. He had um, you know needlepoint over here. It was before he started quilting. He hadn't gotten to quilting yet, and then he wow. had the you know the knitting studio. So he would just sort of go from one thing to the next. And if he got tired of one thing, he'd just go to the next. But he was always doing something. So he's always kind of recharging his batteries and always you know never never really standing still, but always. Um, but still managing to rest and recuperate while he was doing this other thing. So uh, that was, you know, really helpful to see and to watch his process and watch him work. It was really, really great. That's fantastic. Yeah. So you're, did, je you're jealous. I'm, and I'm not jealous. I'm, I'm envious. <laughs> envious is the word. Yeah. He's trying to think, how can I, I could do that. I could, hey, and then, hey, that's I'm going to call. <laughs> You can go anytime. I'm I, not. I want to talk about knitting in public because okay. you have lots of pictures of you knitting in public. And mm -hmm. some, a lot of guys I talk to either haven't come out yet as knitters yes, and, yeah. and do not want to knit in public. So can you talk a little bit about that and whether or not you think there's a stigma attached to that or what's, sure. what's, what's with guys? And oh, the, I mean, th there is a stigma, but it's all in, you know, our heads it's all yes, in the absolutely it's all yeah. our own fear because my the practical experience was um i i have never very rarely had any pushback about against it uh you know i would i remember <laughs> some stories of knitting on the ttc because i would know the ttc because i'd have to like, I'd go up to my my um security job late at night on the on the Bathurst bus, like straight up Bathurst. Yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. And I'd be knitting out of, I'd have a big bag and be pulling my yarn. Anyway, and I remember, oh, it's my stop, I ring the bell, you know, and I get up and I walk past, I walk past this guy who looked like a, like a hoodlum, right? He looked, it's a little scary guy. And as I, and he, you know, I've been knitting up right across from him. And as I walk past him, he goes, yo. And I go, oh, here it comes. I'm, you know, I'm going to fight or something. And he goes, you dropped your yarn. 
<laughs> so he, had, he handed me my yarn. You dropped Jeez. this. <laughs> oh, thanks, man. And then I, there's another time I uh, I was knitting on the on the subway. I, I a friend of mine. I, I was sitting with a, a friend of mine. We were actors, and we were coming back from a job. And I pulled up my knitting. He says, "What, what are you doing that? Aren't you, aren't you a little embarrassed to be knitting in public?" I said, "No, should I be?" And just then, because I were on the subway, the doors yeah. open, and a drop dead gorgeous girl like like four or five levels above my pay grade right <laughs> yeah walks in comes onto the, the the car and she sees me knitting goes oh you're knitting that's i love that she comes right over sits right beside me and i turn and look at my friend <laughs> yeah, that's... Hmm? Ah. there that's you go so... that's better than having a puppy <laughs> that's right oh, it's way way it's way better yeah so same same sort of thing so in pretty much every every time anytime anybody would talk to me it would always be very very positive and uh lots of you know moms saying to their kids you see anybody can knit just do that yeah so yeah. uh yeah it's been great it's been wonderful what are you gonna say i i i don't know <laughs> i was waiting for you because i i know that you just you were just i, I was gonna bring up because you were just on a, a panel where you were discussing that and we were talking about uh lewis out of you know his brooklyn boy knits yeah. um and he he was noticed you know on you know the new york new york subway knitting and he's kind of looking a little rough around the edge you know beard and very masculine and but then there's this contradiction with knitting because you don't associate it with that but we know and you know more than i do you know in history because we just had this discussion and we talked about it um you know the history of knitting where you know it was a men's a man's profession back in the centuries you know as it would be a blacksmith where you had to apprentice for yeah it was a number of years six years um and then you know and then it fell out of fashion with um with you know uh machine knitting and that sort of thing but then in the wartime when you know they were knitting you know everyone you know called the knitting for uh, garments for especially socks for men and that sort of thing and yeah. men took it up again but um you know it's become it's become as the average person would think now it's still little old ladies or just women who knit so to see right. uh, a man and we know you were called the brad pitt of knitting because i heard that somewhere <laughs> <laughs> so you know a handsome man knitting um it's just sort of like it's it's it is more of a conversation because you have this lovely lady saying this but any any woman or person would be like wow you knit and they're almost mesmerized by it but they're also interested in knowing like why and yeah. how and that sort of thing yeah, and I think the novelty is is sli is slowly wearing off because there's more there's more men knitting in public now. Yes, there are. Yeah, which is fantastic. I want to go back to the panels, if that's all right. And yeah, sure. And I was interested in knowing the, the the yarn that you used. Was it a, a bunch? Because I saw you in a room with <laughs> surrounded <laughs> or, or being swallowed up by balls of yarn. So I was just yeah, wondering yeah. what was the thought process of, of figuring out what you were going to use in, in in order to make the stitch glass. Right. Well, originally, you know, when I when I drew up the um, the grant application, I was very you know, art, artistic about it, very esoteric. I said, I'm only going to use natural fibers, right? It just, yeah. It's going to be a cotton or silk, silk I can use, and wool and, you know, blends of those things maybe, but it's just going to be natural. That's it. I want to do it that way. And then, of course, I start knitting, and um, it occurs to me that um, I need... A, because I'm doing stained glass, um, the canes or the little the the the, the parts that hold the, the, the pieces of glass together, the lead, the lead are called canes, and of course they're metallic. And to make them look metallic, well, you know, I should probably use something metallic. And I found then, and I was in Paris. I was in um, a fantastic shop called La Droguerie in Paris, at, um, in the Les Halles. Uh, Les Halles, num uh, neighborhood of oh, Paris, yeah. just beside uh, um, Saint Eustache Cathedral. Anyway, uh, and I found this this amazing spun like metal <laughs> yarn, and it, like it, it almost looked like yeah. they were making chainmail. Right? <laughs> I thought, oh, I gotta have that, and so I mixed that with black yarn, and then I found you know the spun copper yarn too, and it had you know a nice shine to it. I thought, well, I'll we'll bring that in, and then it was basically you know okay, I'll do it. I'll take anything as long as I like the color, as long as you know it can work work for me. That's great. What I didn't use were um, pretty variegated yarns because that's sure. that's kind of I mean that's taking the bat out of my hands, so to speak. I mean. I make the color choices. I don't want the right. yarn to do it, right? Yes. That's, yeah. 
that's not what that's not what I want to do, uh, which is which is ironic because I remember when I first started knitting, I would see some variegated yarns. I think there was a there was a lopy yarn of some sort. This is so this is back in the like nineties. Um, there was a lopy yarn that had flecks of color in it, and I thought, wow, that's really fancy. I want to do something with that. And so that was sort of the one of the things that um, uh, interested me back then. But now, you know, I want to have control over that color and when i say i want to have control of it i mean i, I want to make the choice but i think that i find the thing that's interesting especially with knitting with, with multiple colors is i is i don't have control once i've made the choice then i sort of lose control over it and the colors do what they're going to do in the sweater yes. it's sort of like i've heard watercolor painting be something like that you have to let the the paint and the water do its own thing and mm. sometimes it works out really well and sometimes <laughs> yes. it, eh, not so well but you know it, you, you kind of give give yourself up to the medium that way yeah and we understand i could understand that part even though i'm you know new newish knitter but we, we know about multicolors you know dyed multicolored and it will eventually create a pattern you know depending on how it was dyed but it's really out of your control and then the end result is it, what it may be and that's the question yeah. You get most often with your colored um, multicolors. They want to know how is that going to knit up, though. Well, they don't they knit up. They're yeah. very much they knit up similar. Yeah, yeah. Eventually, you'll yeah, get yeah. some sort of a pattern. But for what you're trying to do, you you specifically want to control your art and how it's yeah. going to fade and adjust and mix yeah. and match. So you don't want a random multicolored yeah. yarn that's just going to do its own thing. Yeah, I do. I do love a variegated yarn for socks, and I've actually used some of your yarn. Uh, for a pair of socks oh. it was fan fabulous beautiful yeah. it's beautiful cream and blue so that's for socks absolutely because you know that's so it's so small <laughs> i've got time to do that yeah <laughs> i do that oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah that's funny uh it is, can we talk about yarn bombing sure I, I, yeah so why don't you start <laughs> so. well i you know th that was something it, of course in, in some ways, the uh, the stitch glass is like one big yarn bomb. I mean, I, I have, I want to have something to say with it, right? It was a project yeah. that was not just something that was nice to look at, but also it had it, it had some, a thesis and a, and a message. And when I saw people um, yarn bombing, uh, and some of it was very whimsical, but, I, but the, the things that were really powerful for me were the things that had the whimsy and the political statement with them too. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, um, so covering things that, that weren't supposed to be covered in, in yarn with, with yarn. And, uh, and so um, I wanted to, you know, try that. And, and um, my, uh, my eldest uh, Findlay is, um, is, is gay. Uh, they came out, uh, uh, I think, when was that grade 11? Think of it when they were in grade 11. Um, and I wanted to uh, show them uh, my my support. And um, and I didn't really have time until, you know, finally got that um, stitch glass thing finished. And um, we started out with a, a rainbow a tree sweater for the tree in our front yard. Mm -hmm. And um, it occurred to me that I could actually move that. And just a lot of people said, oh, that's beautiful. I really like that. You know, would you do one for me? And I thought, you know, actually you can just have this one. Why don't we just move this one around? So that's what we've been doing. We've been, we've been um, moving this rainbow uh, tree sweater around to various, um, to various neighborhoods and for people who would like to have it to you know, really host it for a while. We've got a sign that goes with it that, that identifies what it is and the idea behind it. And we've also got a, for people who'd like to donate something, we, we've got a sign for the Rainbow Railroad. Um, and that's a, a group that um, helps people uh, who are in um, places where uh, LGBTQ people are, um, are persecuted, helps get them out of there and see, yeah. it's, it's that, that's their job. Um, so that's been working really well. And I'm now working on another, uh, another uh, rainbow um, yarn bomb uh, for a wider tree, because <laughs> what trees is, you think, oh, yeah, that's a, a tree. That's not very large around. I'm sure we can make something. Well, when you think about it, that is actually... It's actually what a distance yes, of yes, exactly. that. And yeah. you, you thought, oh, it was just a thin tree, but it's way bigger than you think it is. Yeah. And when you when you think about trying to put your arms around a tree, like that's if I'm about six feet tall, my arm span is six feet tall. That's that's not a very not a very big tree that's six feet around. So 
I've got one that I, I decided, okay, this is going to be big trees. It's going to be 10 feet. And of course, I, I, I'm, I'm, um, I'm actually not knitting it. I'm crocheting it. And I don't, I'm, I don't really crochet that much. And so, but now it's, it's actually about 13 feet long. So, <laughs> so one, one row is taking me a half hour to just crochet. Again, it's <laughs> really basic stitch you know there's nothing complicated about it but it's just like oh my god it's taking forever jeez so I'm, I'm on my i think my fourth color of this big one and but at least it'll be able to go around big trees so that's, that's great a, i just and i like i like this idea of having it traveling and yes you must be able to see it so that's fantastic and what sort of so what sort of groups or people are 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 hosting it, are having it, and then you know they have a connection to where obviously it's great because the donation towards the Rainbow Railway. So you have people specifically could call you up and say, "Hey, I want I want this to use it to to have it out yeah. there." It's just reason. it's just yeah, it's just been the, the geography of it. I mean, it went um, uh, the first place it moved from our house was actually down the street sort of run around the corner, not very far away at all, but you know, maybe, maybe 500 meters away from our house. But that house is on a street where way more kids walk past it to get to school, mm -hmm. right? Okay. Our, house is, our house is very close, but not as many kids, you know, are walking to the school down my street. So um, what happened was <laughs> lots and lots of people would see it there and they would have, they had people stopping and taking pictures and little kids hugging the tree and doing all that. Um, oh, all that's that fantastic. Stuff. That's great. And, and just based on that and people taking selfies of themselves and putting that up and then other people seeing that and based on that kind of uh, word of mouth, I guess, or uh, uh, people would say, hey, um, would, would you like to come to Burlington? I'd love to have you in Burlington. And so, you know, we took it out to Burlington. Uh, yeah. And, uh, and again, people just, particularly in the, um, in these crazy pandemic times, it was a, it was a really bright, interesting, fun thing that brightened people's uh, neighborhoods and people would stop on their walks or, you know, they'd drive by, they'd stop, they'd back yeah. up, they'd get out, they'd take the selfies and they'd, they'd drive off. So, you yeah, know, it's good. And that in itself, isn't that, exactly what it's about because it, it is it is sending out a message and isn't there just you know there's the donation part of it to the rainbow uh railway which is railway. a fantastic railway what did i say way Rail the rainbow railroad. railroad as in the underground railroad you want to get yes. out of there over to this destination along the that's railroad right. so that's it the donation part but the part about these children and not even just children like saying children especially because they're so curious and and if, if, if you could educate a child at an early age with what this all means, it's I perfect. mean, isn't that fantastic? And then you have the adults as well. It just creates that conversation. And isn't that what it's about? It's just about, it's a subtle messaging, but it's like, wow. And then they're going to go home. They're going to talk to, they're going to talk to their friends. And with the children, it's all okay. And that I think is key with the younger yeah. generation. I think with these youngsters yeah, sure. to, to grow up to say, like, yeah, okay, it's rainbow. It means this. Yeah. Right. Which is, yeah. yeah. I think it's it's very, that. very, yeah, very normalizing. Yeah. Very normalizing. In fact, our, I remember uh, our son, um, when he, he was in I don't know, maybe grade two or three or four or something. And he came home one day from school and said, mom, dad, what, um, what's, what's homophobia? What's that mean? And we explained it to him. We said, oh, yeah. people, um, are they object to people of the same sex who like, like to a family having two dads? People are upset about that or finding two moms. And we explained the whole thing. And he looked at us, but I don't get it. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't see. I don't, what's, what's, I don't get it. What are, you, what are they talking about? That's a fantastic right? response. He wow. just, he like, I said, okay, keep, keep, yeah, I am not understanding why they're upset yeah. again still. Can you explain that to me again? Because it doesn't make any sense. And that's, I, I think this is, well, part of that is like, what's, what's the problem? There's sure. no problem. Yeah. This is the I, way it is. This is great. Yeah. So that's fantastic. Yeah. So what it should be. Absolutely. So what's yeah. coming up next for Kurt? Um, hmm. Well, it'd be interesting to see uh, if and when live theater comes back. Because uh, yeah. um, I'd love to get out and, and do that. And that's... Um, that's going to be, uh, I guess we're going to fall off that bridge when we get to it, because um, 
I'm going to need, or, or it's going to take some time to get the, the show back up to speed, which of course, uh, because I'm a technically a professional actor, I'm mean, part of a union and, and the people I work with are, are union members. I expect to be make, you know, um, make a living wage out of this. I'll have to come up with the money to get going again to rehearse it and get it back up and moving. So um, we'll do that. And um, as I said, I'm working on the Knitting Pilgrim Talks. So yes. that's the, uh, I'm still um, talking to doing, you know, this kind of Zoom interviews with um, with various uh, various folks. So I'm still working on that. And um, I've got that huge rainbow uh, tree to finish yep. off. Oh my gosh. <laughs> That's a lot of work, and yeah, and then just designing anything I can, any any time. I mean, as you know, there's, there's just there's no it's no end of things to knit, True. Um, and it, it, lots of in that crazy place of you see something that's beautiful, and you think, oh, I'd like to knit that. I think, who am I kidding? I have no time to knit that. Yeah, I got, I, I got so many other things I have to do first. Like I've, I'm supposed to generate projects. There's so many ideas and so many things I would like to knit. Um, so many projects I've put on the back burner. So I would love to be doing uh, more knitting, but you know, it's a, as we know, it's a very labor intensive um, craft and hard to, yeah, hard to monetize that. So yeah. uh, that's, that's the trick. So, well, we got, I got lots to keep me busy for sure. Yeah. And, yeah. I, and I'm just thinking, I mean, maybe it's one of the, your, I'm just curious to see what maybe an upcoming project may be, you know, along the lines of the, the tapestries, because that, if you were to consider doing something again along those lines, what I'm seeing a common thread, well, let's say even just between the two projects, the tapestries and the rainbow connection, let's call it, um, and you've, you've, you've come through this journey that started, you know, 15 years ago, and I'm finding it as well. I want to mention one other thing. I think the three together, if you've, you've also written books or you've written um, and produced plays, um, one, being, um, one being The uh, Lost Land, which again oh, yeah. is like <laughs> conflict and differences. Conflict resolution. Yeah. yeah, conflict and resolution. Yeah, yeah. And I'm, yeah. conflict is usually because of differences. And there's mm -hmm. you know that connection there with the conflict resolution sameness with religion there's commonalities there's conflict the rainbow um project that you've you know the bomb rainbow bombing um all of this ties into you you have a bigger message you you've you've come to this journey where there's there's messaging and it seems you know that everyone is looking to why conflict and why can't we all just get along? And why is it not, you know, if we have so much in common, you know, as, as human beings, let's say, you need to create, you're looking at these, these perhaps um, connecting paths, but it's almost like there's a pattern you need to, to develop, some kind of a pattern, a life pattern that shows an end result of isn't it just so simple that we should just all get along and have some common ground and just one connecting pattern that you need to develop that I could see you developing in a new window, not based on religion, just based on a pattern, a life pattern that we should all just follow naturally as one. Conflict, conflict resolution for sure. Yeah, it's a big part. And that's, and that, you know, ironically, I mean, it's uh, it's quite a, quite um, insightful of you to pick that up because the the work I do as a as a customer service consultant is all about I mean the interesting stuff for me is the conflict resolution is about how to get people to uh, talk to each other and hear each other and um, and get on the same page and yeah find that common ground for sure that would be that would be something I would love to do one one question we have we ask all of the interviewees is Who's your fiber hero? If so, if you had to think about all the people you've met in your life with respect to knitting, crocheting, um, fiber, who would that be? Hmm. Um, I met some great, uh, great people. Uh, I would say probably it'd have to be uh, Kafe, Kafe Fassett. He he's the one who really um, you know started me uh, started me off. I think. Um, uh, people who also did some amazing, I mean, Elizabeth Zimmerman was, you know, groundbreaking. And um, uh, I think it's, um, 
Was it, yeah. I, was it Debbie New who did the lots of um, uh, geometric, uh, interesting uh, things? Just, just the, like the mathematical end, end of things. Yeah. Um, and those like those things are really, I think, um, really fascinating. But for and, and I've got a very good friend who was um, who inspired me with with her work. This is uh, Janet Morton who knit a, a house cozy yes. on Toronto Island. She she knit a whole thing, and that was I thought, oh, well, Janet can do that. I can I can knit a couple stained glass windows. <laughs> really I actually I was fortunate enough to be at the right place at the right time, and one of her pieces went on for auction, and I was able to pick it up. Oh, uh, fantastic! And so I, it's it's hanging up in in in, in a room, um, so I was really really excited about that. So it's, oh, that's great! Yeah, yeah, Janet was a real um, inspiration as well. So the yeah, yarn, with the yarn, yeah, yeah, another one, the yarn. <laughs> yes, okay, yeah. In this piece, she, she I think she found some photos and she added fiber to the to the photos. So it was a little different right. than it wasn't the same scale as as her other art. Uh, right. um, yeah. But it's yeah, it was it was a perfect size anyway. Uh, so where can people find you if they want to look for you? Um, I have a website, uh, kirkdunn.com. That's probably the easiest place to uh, to find me. Um, I think I'm at uh, Kirk Knits Official on Instagram. And I I have a Twitter account, and I but I just sort of go on Twitter to read stuff. I don't really post yeah. very often. And I can't even tell you what it is, right? Because I just <laughs> sort of click it. Oh, well, we, were gonna, <laughs> we will find it, and we will post everything in the show notes. And what, I, okay. and what I would like to see for for yourself, Kirk, is that I said at the beginning, and I know that you 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 mentioned that you know people do know your tapestries. There are people out there, and there is a documentary. There is your one man show. I knew all of that, and but my point is that I think, and I could see that these works of art need to be just out there. I think that there are so many more people who could um, be inspired by them, and who could just you know, on a personal level, level, um, learn from them. And overall, it just is screaming for a wider audience. And I think that audience is, is, is just going to come because it seems like your one man show and then COVID started. This is just the beginning for you and this because these panels and your message is bigger than it's all of us. Yeah, it's absolutely great. Uh, so I just wanted to thank you Kirk, so much for spending the time with us. It was such a joy to, to interview with you. And, and I, I, usually get it. I, I'm, I haven't even been to your show and I'm emotional already <laughs> because I do believe in what I see and hear and have learned from you. And I think it's, uh, it's, it, it's only meant to be bigger and it will, I feel. Well, I, I, I can't wait to I get you to see the show. I hope to be able yes. to bring it to somewhere yes. where you are. Yeah, absolutely. And thank you guys for this. This is an excellent opportunity, a wonderful chance to, well, for me to talk and to, to get to know you as well. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That was so much fun interviewing Kirk. What an amazing guy and what an accomplished guy and what a humble guy. My gosh, like he was in a film in Cannes in 1989 and that didn't even come up. I think he's, that'd be off the lips of, of, of the first thing off someone's lips. He starred in the film. He's, oh yeah, he started. He would never tell you that either. So, so we're telling you that and we'll put a link to, to the review as well. And I have to say that uh, you mentioned how he's fourth generation of, um, well, no, yeah, he's fourth generation of, yes. in, in the ministry, Presbyterian ministries. And he, he yeah. takes part of it. He's not a minister, but I think he's the wool minister. Well, that's funny. I, I agree with you. He said he didn't follow in his father's footsteps. But I think he did. I think he just has a different ministry. Absolutely. Because, you know, he's, he has his, the, the panels and the 15 year um, journey that he was on. I mean, yeah. that evolved into a real a good message. I mean, there's uh, many messages there that we discover along the way. And in his one man show, The Knitting Pilgrim. Yeah. And then when you think about the um, the. Rainbow Railroad as well with his um, his his yarn bombing yep. of the rainbow yep. and it's a traveling yarn bomb and that in itself is the donation towards that very great um, well that's it's also but that's also part of his outreach program like it's like he he does so much community work and so much outreach that's why I think I, I think that there's a very close tie between he and his father one of the one of the other key ingredients I think in his success is Claire, his wife. He mentioned her a couple of times, and I love how she 
kind of guided him over to Calf Bassett and said, go and talk to him. I thought that was, oh, she, sent that was him on, she sent him on his way. She and, said, you go, you go do this. It's important to you. Yeah. It's, it's something you'd want to do. And off he went for a, a month or so. Yeah. And the other thing that I found amazing was when he was, said he was sitting in church and he was looking up at the stained glass and he thought, that's, that's my project. And I thought, who looks at stained glass and connects it to knitting? I thought that that was phenomenal, yeah, and he's exactly. done an amazing job of it. But that's something that wouldn't come into most people's minds. Well, I mentioned to him because I, I still truly believe that this is just the beginning of where this is going. Because yeah. of the, the storyline within the uh, one-man show, which I've not seen yet, but just from the reviews and the reactions of, of audiences, it seems to me that he has an awful lot of good to say. And, and, and so it, it is so... Um, uh, relevant today yeah, and, and what's going on around the world today and that along with his other messaging or his other good deeds um, and his connection to the LGBTQ community yeah. um, that as well is all about inclusion and everyone just getting along and there's a true message there that that I still uh, needs to get out there and part of us doing this and having him is hopefully that message gets around. Yeah. And I forgot to thank him also when the first time I met him was at the Toronto Knitters Guild. And oh. um, so I was, and I knew about him and I, a number of people in the knitting community said, have you met him yet? And so when I was giving my talk at the Toronto Knitters Guild, I was looking out into the audience and he was sitting there and then <laughs> the chaos around um, selling my yarn afterwards because I forgot my um, my machine to tally all the sales and it was it was there were a lot you of people that you could <laughs> look at the yarn you couldn't buy it no so we figured that out but it was just a lot of chaos and a lot of people wanting to to speak and then he shows up and everything just seemed to calm down or at least I tuned you know what I think happened I probably tuned everything out and just focused on Kirk uh, but it was it, it definitely calmed me down so it was and the funny thing about the whole thing is in the end you, you also had a giveaway oh, yes. of all things had the giveaway and who won your yarn yeah Kirk so Kirk it was meant to be it was this should be was meant to be and he and then he he even met, he mentioned about he's knitted yes. with your yarn and that's where I remembered he knitted with your yarn yeah well, it was probably the yarn that yarn probably yeah. Yeah. So, but I, you know what? I when I was looking through his CV, I noticed something that I found very interesting. CV. Ye, his resume. <laughs> that you. It's possible that you. The corporate people out there. You may have met him before me, actually, because I noticed that he was on the film set of Queers Folk, and you've been on the set of Queers Folk. So it's possible oh, that the two of you may have it met. It is quite possible. I yeah. was. I was in specific scenes i said but not i didn't have any big role whatsoever um but you're the husband of one of the main characters i was the husband of i was the I, yes i was the fiance of one of the um oh, the lesbian fiance. couple's uh mother gets married and i'm i'm the groom right <laughs> there you go <laughs> believe it or not to a woman <laughs> stranger things have happened <laughs> so i may have met him. i may have met him i've seen him on the set i may have even met him on the set I don't know. That well, was a long time ago. <laughs> Regardless, it was <laughs> either way. We, we coincidence. Yeah, it was a coincidence, but but nothing's really a coincidence. No, that's true. So it was. Uh, we had, I had so much fun interviewing him. I even I think I teared up a couple times. You did. <laughs> I may have as well because it, it's it's the it's it's the emotion of these of what he's doing. I think Another and project. and his 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 personal journey and and the message that you know. The world should be as one, and we should all get along based on based on anything that we are always conflicted about in this world today, which would be you know religion or inclusivity and the LGBTQ community and and not just that racism as well yeah. all of it combined is is he he, he manages manifests that through his one man show and these stained glass knitted stitch windows. And, and also with his community work, it's all just him being out yeah. there and putting it all um, on the front line as to let's just all be one, as one and get along. And Yeah, and with respect to his charity work, I was really impressed to see that he's doing work with the Rainbow Railroad because they are a phenomenal organization and doing really important work. And I'm definitely putting a link there so everyone can read more about them. So that was... Quite something. I, I really enjoyed chatting with, with Kirk. 
it was by far, um, I think, one of the more, for me, one of the more, it did, it, it touched a lot of, 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 of deep rooted emotion for me as well. Yeah. And so for that reason, I think it, it's, it's, it was a wonderful, wonderful experience and interview. And uh, we thank you for uh, taking the time and spending the time with us. So thank you, Kirk. And thank you everyone for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.